Welcome, Glenn Shorrock, back in. Great to have you here again. Cheers, Paul. And uh, let me see, 45 years that you're about to go out and do in one mm. show. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's, it's been a bit more than that over the last uh, few years, mate. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do two shows, actually. Um, one at the region here in Melbourne and the one at the State Theatre in Sydney. Yeah. Um, the two shows I've been looking forward to. Um, I've been doing a lot of acoustic shows in the last few years. Smaller ones, more casual, more relaxed, smaller venues around the country. This one puts me back into the pressure zone a little bit. Yeah. So I'm pulling out all the stops and trying to make it uh, you know, a memorable thing for myself and also for the audience. Like it's 45 years in uh, you know, a couple of hours. That's almost like the time-lapse photography tour, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of material to draw from and that's one of the problems I have right now is to... Uh, compile a, a show that doesn't disappoint people when you don't do one particular song. Obviously the main ones I'll do, you know, the, mm. the help on its ways and those sort of things, but I want to go back over some of the albums that I've done in the past, solo album, uh, Monsoon and um, mm. those sort of things, Twilight's Maxim. Yeah, will it be chronological? Pardon? Chronological? <laughs> <laughs> you mean we'll, we'll, we'll flow along? Um, well, I mean, when we'll, you start back at the, uh, you know, Adelaide 1965 and, and, yeah, and progress along. Yeah, I, I'll open the show with a song. I'm, I'm not quite sure what yet. And then, I, yes, I'll start, you know, my career began in Adelaide 19, whatever it was, and um, run through a few tunes in the Twilights and then on to Axiom and then, of course, LRB and All and Sundry. And then it's... it's um, well, every man for himself after that. Yeah. Do you remember your very first single? Yeah. What was it Just. Uh, it's called I Don't Know Where the Wind Will Blow Me. Right. Twilights. We got to number 10 on the Adelaide 5AD chart. Uh, we were unknown anywhere else apart from Adelaide in those days. I wrote the song. Mm -hmm. And um, and then, of course, uh, Terry Britton started writing and... We recorded Needle in the Haystack, uh, following our move from Adelaide to, to here in Melbourne, and where we became the, you know, the Twilights that everybody knew and loved. And um, well, uh, we had a we had a few good good songs, didn't we? Well, I tell you what, Terry Britton in the band back in yeah. those days. I mean, he was a great know, asset. What, whatever happened to him after the Twilights? Never oh, heard from him know. again, he, did we? He won some sort of award, yeah. Grammy or something. <laughs> Did he strike you as like this brilliant songwriter at the time? Because of course he went on to you know write you know, oh, yeah, some great I, hits for I, Tina Turner. Yes, uh, yeah, no, I, I knew Terry was going to do something special sooner or later. He was a great guitar player. He, he just had an affinity for for pop music, and it, it came to him very easily. He, he could write a good lyric and write a good melody and play it and sing it as well. Um, yeah, I'm not surprised that he's done so well. Um, we still keep in touch. I'll be seeing him when I go off to England in May. Uh, we'll catch up. And another Twilight is going to be over there at the same time, a guy called uh, John Bywaters, who was mm. the, the bass player. So uh, we'll have a bit of a reunion. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. There were some uh, amazing names on that debut album. I mean, Barry Gibb wrote a song for you, didn't he? Uh, yes. Can't remember what, which one it was. <laughs> but he that was album there. was recorded very quickly. Yeah. yeah. As, as, as albums were then. Yeah. I think we did that in two days, that, that album, mm. yeah. But, um, no, the Twilights are still my favourite band for a, a lot of sort of emotional reasons. They were, we were good mates that became good musicians, if you know what I mean. We were musicians that became mates, yeah. which comes, came later mm. with my subsequent bands. You must have been one of the first Australian bands to, uh, to go over to England, I guess, and record. Mm. Well, the Easy Beats did. Uh, I can't remember the chronological order, uh, to repeat your long word. Um, uh, was was the Twilights first or was the group first? Uh, but a lot of us went over there, you know, in the, in the 60s and dashed ourselves on the white cliffs of Dover and came home with our tails between <laughs> our legs, really. Uh, the group, you know, the Masters, yeah. Apprentices, Twilights, of course. Oh, gosh, Procession. Yeah. Oh, Procession, there's a, there's yeah. a band from the past. Mm -hmm. But you came home, you know, not only with your tail between your legs, but with a, a hit in What's Wrong With The Way I Live. Yeah, yeah, we did did, did a little bit of work over there. Yeah, that I mean, was written the, by the Hollies. Yes, yeah, EMI f uh, found that for us. Mm. A&R department in England said we've got a Holly song, so yeah, we had to listen to that. I said, yeah, that's fine. But the, the main 
exciting part of that uh, trip, which was 19, Christmas was 1966, stroke 67, was the, um, the recording of uh, 950, What's Wrong With The Way I Live, and Young Girl in Studio One, Abbey Road, on January the 6th, 1967, with the Beatles next door doing Penny Lane. Wow. Mm. Did you sort of hang around with the no, Beatles? No, no, we were too much in awe of the whole situation. We were, oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, we were. It was exciting. That was great. But you were heavily influenced by the Beatles, weren't oh, you, of course? Like amazing. everybody was. Everybody was, yeah. yes. I mean, they, they grew moustaches, we grew moustaches. You know? mm. We copied everything. They yeah. started to meditate, we started to meditate. They started to break up, we started to break up. <laughs> <laughs> so we, were you more George, John or Paul? Oh, I was John to begin with, yeah. yeah. John made a big influence on me just as a rock and roll singer, originally. But, you know, McCartney is... McCartney's a large part of it, but I, I was really more moved by George's passing than John's actually, because it was just such a shame that George had to succumb to cancer after having been attacked and you know been through a pretty bad time of uh, in his last years. Yeah, so I'm I'm very sad about that, and I'm I'm going to do a George Harrison song in the show. I think. All right, which yeah. one? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> we have to come to the show. That's right. <laughs> well, it fits in with the last 45 years anyway. Now, there was, uh, you well, know... I you can't remember it. <laughs> there was a, uh, a, a TV series around the Twilights. Uh, the no, there was a pilot that was going to be yeah. a series. So it never, never made it through. We made a pilot. Does that tape still exist? Yeah. Yeah? Hmm. I, I might throw it up on the screen the concert that'd be cool yeah not all of it yeah just to show people how really dumb it was maybe maybe <laughs> a uh, a bonus dvd on a forthcoming Led Shorrock album yeah that's an idea isn't it yeah will you yeah. be recording these shows uh yes i probably will be yeah um but i'm i am working on another anthology of my work you know subsequent of uh baker uh, glenn a baker put together the f glenn Shorrock the first 20 years and we're now putting together the second 20 years mm -hmm. which takes us through till about 96 or something. Right. Oh, so you've got another album after that to come then. Yeah. You know, do the third. No, I think I'll be running out because, <laughs> you know, we're looking around at all different outtakes and demos and yeah. live recordings and stuff that I've done and commercials. Mm. But, you know, Baker's pretty amazing like that. He, he knows more about my career than, than I do. Yeah. Well, you're doing pretty well. You're answering all the questions correctly. So far, yes. Yeah. Axiom, you know, like, uh, you know, straight out of the twilights breaking up. Uh, what a what a what a break it was that the group were also breaking up, and the uh, <laughs> the combination of uh, Glenn Shorrock and Brian Cadd came together. Yeah, uh, I'd known Brian. I met Brian, you know, when he was with the Jackson Kings, and then with uh, with the group with Ronnie Charles, and they made some terrific records that I really loved. I really had a soft spot for for Brian's writing, along with Don Moody, his, his partner. A woman, you're breaking me in such a lovely way. They were great songs of the 60s, and um, yeah, we found ourselves at, a, at Meldrum's, one of Meldrum's parties, I think it was. As and, you do. As you do, and um, you know, I just heard this, ah, oh, mate, you want to start a band? <laughs> <laughs> I looked down, and, well, I could look down, I could look down at Brian. I can't look down at many people, but I can look down at Brian. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, he's, I said, yes, who are you? <laughs> I said, have you got any songs? He said, dear boy, I've got Arkansas grass. I said, yes, but have you got any songs? <laughs> so we retired to his the back seat of his Simca and hashed a plan for world domination, Yeah, starting with Paran. Well, that wasn't a bad song to debut for you that night. Arkansas grass, yeah, it was yeah. good. That, that uh, went top ten, I think, and... And then we followed up with Little Ray of Sunshine, and that was a number one hit, and um, we're still singing that one. And you can't stop singing that one. Radio stations can't stop playing it every time no, no, a kid no, is born. a big requested number. That yeah. One. yeah. Who, who was the kid that it was written about? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think Don had a, a friend that had a baby, and he was just you know, caught up in the emotion of it all. And, but it's, a kind of, it's kind of a left-field song for Axiom, because we, we were more into country rock, you know, and the band and, and Stephen Stills and Buffalo Springfield, and, and this song came out of left field, in a way, because it's kind of a mm. pop song, isn't it? It's a sporty pop song. But, uh, hey, I'm not gonna bite the hand that fed me. It's a 
It's a terrific song. Yeah, and then you signed to Warner and My Baby's Gone was another hit for the band. We went to England and recorded My Baby's Gone and, um, well, Don Moody got sick in England, uh, things weren't going well for the band and so again, you know, we split up. Mm. But this time I said, I'm not going back again. I'm tail between my leg, I'm going to stay here. And I'd started writing some songs uh, towards the latter days of, of uh, Axiom. Uh, songs like Statue of Liberty and the first draft of Help Was On Its Way. And so I carried on in England um, as a songwriter and then became lead singer of a band called Esperanto. And then uh, in the latter days of my stay there, I was the backup singer for Cliff Richard. Mm. And uh, so that brought me around again to, to working with Terry Britton and Alan Tarney and Trevor Spencer and pe people like that who I'd grown up with in, in Elizabeth. Yeah. South Australia. So how, how did the, the initial uh, formation of Little River Band come together? Uh, I, got, I guess I got a phone call from Beat um, saying that they were in England, uh, Mississippi, their band had broken up and they were, they were thinking about forming another band, going back to, to Australia uh, with Glenn Wheatley on board as a manager and they wanted a lead singer. I said, oh, okay. Because I, I was pretty dispirited by then. Nothing mm. had really worked for me in five years, you know, sort of any success. I had a good time and started writing some good songs, but uh, my career wasn't sort of moving in any direction. So I was kind of thinking about going home anyway and just maybe becoming an agent or a manager or something like that. And then he said, well, let's get together and we'll play some songs to each other. And we did. And, well, when I heard songs like It's a Long Way There and I'll Always Call Your Name and Reminiscing hadn't been written by then, but... You know, and with my songs, I felt the way the, the way we came together and sang easily together as in the harmony. Um, I said, "Yeah, I think this is going to work." And so they all went back, and I came back a little further down the line, and we, we met in Carlton, and we stayed at Jim Key's place for a little while, slept on his floor, and he helped us out because we came back with nothing. I yeah. came back with a suitcase, and um, you know, we, we put the band together, and the rest is. It's history, isn't it? So you've got a song like Help Us On Its Way that you've written prior to this. Mm. Why does it take so long to get an album? A song like that that became an Australian classic on mm. an album. Did well, you not I, notice it? I hadn't finished it. Mm. Help Us On Its Way was two songs that I stuck together. I had Hang On and Help Us On Its Way. <laughs> <laughs> it was. One song was called Hang On, the other one was called Help Us On Its Way. So I thought, well, it's a bit silly. I'll stick them together. And that's why it's got that modulation in it. You know, mm. It's got the different keys in it. It's mm. good. It mm. worked out well. Yeah. Did, did it surprise you what it became as big as it was? Um, surprised, yeah. I was kind of, I, I'm kind of proud of the song. And the band did it, did it well. It's been, it worked very well, especially in America. It was our first breakthrough you know, hit over there. And um, thank goodness they're still playing it. Mm. I, I always thought the best LRB song was Sane City. Thank you. Yeah, it's one of my favourite compositions. That was on second album, wasn't it? Mm. After, After Hours, which was our best album, mm. I thought. Even though it wasn't a big seller, no. like the, the rest, no, that's I, a favourite album. I really think we hit, hit a pocket there, you know, that was a, a good album. Um, yeah, Sane City was uh, taken from my personal experiences of romance in Paris. Mm. Because it was good to hear that back in the set list when you were doing uh, Bertle Charlotte Goebel. Yeah, I, I still do, I love doing that. Mm. We'll yeah. do it, we'll do it on the on the on the show at the region as well yeah well there have been so many songs i mean you know after we went to uh, diamond tina cocktail um which you know uh, after listening to casey Kaysen once i discovered was uh, made from emu eggs emu <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. you know that that started to take off then you know the next round of little river band really broke it into america didn't it yeah, well with albums like first under the wire and sleeper catcher yeah they were our biggest sellers um, singles, uh, Reminiscing Lady. We had, I think, something in the region of 10, or eight, eight or 10 top 20 hits anyway, and I think six of them were top 10. Yeah. We never got to number one, but we got to number the top five a few times, and I think um, Reminiscing peaked at three. Mm. So back in the days when it was actually good to have American hits and sell records. Mm. Uh, mm. Which rewarded you quite nicely as well. There was Thank a, you very much. There was a, a yacht in Sydney Harbour. Is oh, did I? 
Did you have a yacht at one point? I was a stink boat, wasn't a yacht, yeah. unfortunately. I had a small yacht, I had a little Hobie cat alongside my larger cruiser. Okay. What about living in Fiji? Uh, what about living in Fiji? Yeah. Um, I built a house there. Yeah. Yeah, I had that for about 20 years. Oh, about, no, about 16, 18 years. And um, I still have a great affection for Fiji, but I've sold it now. Mm. Moved on a bit. I'm still looking for the other escape. It might be up in Byron Bay, somewhere or like that. Yeah, well, the music industry has served you well. It has. And so it should. I'm very lucky. Yes. Now, I had 45 years and it's been good for me. I mean, I haven't, uh, nothing's really bad that's happened to me. Everything's been good and I've been working with some great songwriters, singers and musicians. Mm. Yeah, it's all worked out the way it's supposed to work out. Yeah. Well, we, we hear Queen Elizabeth is a very big fan of Undercover. <laughs> she watches all of our interviews and, you know, I think... <laughs> So Glenn Shorrock is well overdue. <laughs> Thanks, but, Betty. No, I don't know whether I can be um, awarded in, uh, that because I'm not Australian. You see, I still carry a, a British passport. So you could be well. That's so I can't. No, that's right. I, I can't be made um, you know, Aust- Order and, of Australia or something like that. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm not Australian. No, we're hanging out for that, Sir Glenn Shorrock. Thank you very much. much. <laughs>